What were some of the major contributions made by the Libertarian Nobel Prize winning economist Friedrich Hayek? Join Richard Ebeling and me in this week's Libertarian Angle as we examine that question. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and welcome to this week's Libertarian Angle, the show that you all know brings you the principled, uncompromising case for the libertarian philosophy. I'm joined by my co-host, Richard Eveline, Professor Par Excellent at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again. Good to be back with you two and our viewers and listeners. Yeah, thanks for tuning in again. So Richard, you know, you were the Ludwig von Mises Professor of Economics at Hillsdale College for many, many years. And you were, of course, also president of the Foundation for Economic Education at that had a strong relationship to Austrian economics, to Mises and Israel Kirzner, another prominent Austrian economist. And so I thought what we would do today is, is focus on the major contributions of really one of the most famous, if not the most famous libertarian Austrian economist, and that's Friedrich Hayek. Um, Hayek, as you know, won the Nobel Prize. I mean, this, this is quite an achievement for a libertarian. And um, he has made such significant contributions to economics and to libertarianism. So I thought, let's focus uh, a libertarian angle show on what were the significant contributions of Friedrich Hayek. But before we do that, since you were the, the guy that really knows steeped in Austrian economics, why don't you give us a little summation of who Friedrich Hayek was, you know, Friedrich Hayek the man. Why don't you explain to us who Friedrich Hayek was? Well, Friedrich Hayek, who, as you mentioned, did win the Nobel Prize in 1974, uh, was born in 1899 in the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, he came from a scientific family. His father was, I gather, a rather prominent botanist, um, and uh, he grew up in that type of environment. Uh, he then got caught up as a young man in volunteering for the Austrian army in the First World War. He served on the Italian front, uh, returned from the war, and entered the University of Vienna. Uh, and through a accelerated program introduced for war veterans, uh, he first acquired a law degree. He was a doctor of jurisprudence in 1921. And then two years later in 1923, he won a second doctorate. He earned a second doctorate in political science. Now, um, the thing to point out, because if our viewers or uh, listeners have heard of Hayek, they would think of him as a famous economist. Uh, the, the curriculum was at the University of Vienna at that time that if you wanted to study economics, you did it through the law faculty. So in earning his doctorate in jurisprudence, he in fact became a qualified and trained doctoral level economist as well. Uh, he was soon drawn into the circle uh, of the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, who he went to work for uh, shortly after uh, graduating from the university. Um, and Mises became his mentor for a good number of years. Uh, in fact, Mises helped him establish and then Hayek became the first director of the Austrian Institute for Business Cycle Research. Uh, then uh, in 1931, he was invited to and delivered a series of lectures at the London School of Economics that later in 1931 was published as a little book called Prices and Production uh, that made him an international known economist and scholar and won him a first visiting position and then a permanent position at the London School of Economics, which he held until uh, 1949. And in now moving to the London School of Economics and writing on monetary matters, business cycle matters at first, he entered into this big intellectual clash with John Maynard Keynes. Um, in fact, Keynes had written a book before his famous book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, called A Treatise on Money. And Keynes, as we now know, thought that this book would make him the most well-known and, and respected economist in the world. Well, the book was a flop. Uh, many of the leading economists of that time wrote very critical and scathing, lengthy reviews. But the coup de grace, if you will, was a lengthy two-part review essay that Hayek wrote 
uh, in late 1931, early 1932, that was devastating. In fact, Keynes had to metaphorically go back to Cambridge University licking his wounds and even told Hayek, I no longer believe in these ideas. Of course, he went back and then wrote this other book that became his famous book, uh, the, the, which was the basis of what we now call Keynesian economics. But as a result, um, in, in the 1930s, Hayek was the third most widely cited economist in the economic journals of the English language, uh, uh, English language literature, both of Britain and America. Uh, and then in the middle of the 1930s, he got involved in another um, uh, debate, which made him even more famous. And that was, can socialism work? Uh, his mentor Mises had challenged the ability of socialism uh, in a famous article in 1920, and then in a full length book in 1922 on socialism. And then Hayek then continued that challenge against socialism in the English speaking world, fighting many of those who were saying, what we want is a democratic socialism, a good planning. We have the rational ability to plan. We have the knowledge, we have the wisdom. And Hayek basically ended up culminating in this argument in a famous essay of his called The Use of Knowledge in Society, which appeared in September 1945 in the American Economic Review, the lead article. Uh, in which he basically, as we'll talk a little bit later, uh, challenged the, the, the inability of the central planners ever to know enough to centrally plan an entire society. Uh, and then rushing through this, uh, he left the London School of Economics and took up a position at the University of Chicago in 1949-1950, uh, which he held until 1962. And in that time he wrote, uh, he shifted his interest to political philosophy, as well as the the, the philosophy of law of a free society. That culminated in his 1960 book, uh, The Constitution of Liberty. Uh, he left Chicago in 1962 and took up positions first at the University of Salzburg in Austria, and then finally suddenly at the University of Freiburg in Germany. And in the 1970s, he then published uh, another great book, a book uh, that appeared in three volumes called Law, Legislation and Liberty. Uh, and then in the midst of writing that in, uh, in uh, the fall of 1974, uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, totally unexpectedly. But now having disappeared into obscurity, uh, an often challenged author because he wrote this uh, very popularly and widely read book in World War II called The Road to Serpent, challenging that socialism always means ultimately tyranny and oppression and the denial of the freedom of the individual having fallen into obscurity somewhat in a post-World War II period of socialism, Keynesianism, the intervention of state, uh, winning the Nobel Prize gained him a reawakened international fame. And so for the rest of his life, as long as his mental faculties permitted, he slowed down a bit in his late 80s, early 90s before he died. And, um, he traveled the world. He, he, he continued to write essays. Uh, he wrote a, a book called The Fatal Conceit, challenging again the socialists. He, he wrote a book called Denationalization of Money, saying what the hell is government involved in money at all? We should separate money from the state. Uh, and this was his life. And I should say that, that he also had that, this renewal of his career gave him a chance to interact with a new generation of Austrians. And if I can do so, uh, and if the viewers can successfully see this, there I am with Friedrich Hayek, at an Austrian economics conference in June of 1975 at the University of Hartford in Connecticut. And that's a rather young me I see there. But as I usually tell my students when I'm showing them this picture, notice that Hayek has turned away from me and he's covered his ear. Oh no, not that Evelyn guy again. No, no, not him, please, no. <laughs> that's a very young me. Uh, I was in my twenties uh, with Friedrich Hayek about a year or so after he won the prize. <laughs> and finally, he died. He passed away in uh, in 1992. Uh, actually, just around the shortly before his birthday. Okay, well, that's a ni nice synopsis of, of Friedrich Hayek, uh, the man. Uh, let's talk about some of his significant contributions. Uh, I, the thing that strikes me, and when I was first getting into libertarianism and Austrian economics, was um, number one, the book that you mentioned, the, the Constitution of Liberty, you know, I was practicing law at the time. That was my first career choice. And I was a lawyer for about 12 years. And so 
when I discovered the Constitution of Liberty, it, it had a big impact on me because there's a lot of law in there, in law and economics. And uh, it actually helped me. I ended up teaching a course in law and economics at the University of Dallas, where you were teaching as well. That's where we met. And uh, so that book had a big impact on me. And uh, specifically, the principle of the rule of law, I think that's one of his major contributions. The others that that occur to me or the spontaneous order that concept, the price system, the intricacies of the price system, the denationalization of money. But let me just focus in on the rule of law and why that had such a big impact on me. You know, you hear that phrase today, um, principally among politicians, when they are describing somebody that uh, is uh, is getting a law enforced against them, that, that, oh, that person has to obey the law because that's the rule of law, um, that, that we can't have a public official violating the law because he's violating the rule of law. So their concept of the rule of law is that, the, that the, there's, there's laws out there that, that tell people what to do and what not to do. Well, they've got it a little bit wrong. That what, what Hayek explains about the rule of law is that a free society requires people to answer to the law rather than to this the edicts of public officials. And let me give you an example of this. Let's take drug laws. Let's say there were no drug laws at all. And suddenly a, a, a public official in the community, a sheriff goes out and starts arresting people who are ingesting illicit drugs, marijuana, cocaine. And the person says, what are you doing? It's not against the law. Yeah, but drugs are bad. And therefore, you need to be punished for this. And so I'm going to arrest you, and then I'm taking you to court, and you, you're prosecuted, and you're sent away to jail for five years, even though there's no law. That th these are just the straight edicts of a public official that says I'm going to do the right thing for society. Hayek points out, no, that's not a free society. You have to have a system where people are having to adjust their conduct in response to a well-defined written law. So they can say, okay, what does the law say about drug use? Well, you won't take this drug or this drug or this drug. Okay, but these drugs are not listed, alcohol, tobacco, so I'm going to go in there and comport my conduct and, and ingest those drugs. So clearly, the rule of law is a prerequisite to a free society. You can't have a free society unless people are answering to the law rather than to the individual edicts of public officials. But, and here's the important point, it's not a sufficient prerequisite for a free society. It's, it's a necessary prerequisite, but it's not enough. Uh, we all know as libertarians that drug laws themselves are violations of the fundamental principles of liberty. A person should be free to ingest whatever he wants to ingest. That's partly what freedom's all about. And so a free society requires the repeal of drug laws and repeal of any other law that criminalizes the exercise of fundamental rights that do not involve force or fraud against another person. So you need two things. You, you need a society where people are free to live their lives the way they want, so long as there's no force or fraud. And you also need a society where the law, like a murder law, is well-defined and prescribed in advance where people know exactly what conduct is going to be criminalized and what not what uh, conduct is not going to be criminalized. So that was one of, one of the big contributions that I saw that Hayek made, Richard. I agree with you. But all of this, this idea of general rules uh, of law that are impartial and uh, uh, widen the arena of liberty by narrowing the, 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 the field of uh, of, uh, to, of government to, to securing rights rather than violating them. It was all part of a long evolution. Obviously, he, would have, he was thinking about these things since he did study law himself, as I said, at the University of Vienna in that immediate post-World War I period. Uh, but his evolution, if I can now focus on his economics, if you will, um, he became interested in monetary and business cycle matters. Uh, which, as I said, gave him his initial claim to fame in the world of academia and policy arena, um, basically under the inspiration of Ludwig von Mises. Um, and what he basically argued, was, like Mises, that there is nothing inherently 
in the market economy or in a fairly free banking and monetary system uh, that would generate within itself the cycles of booms and busts, inflations and deflations, uh, 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 rising employment followed by crashes of unemployment in a recession. That this is basically the intrusion, the injection uh, of government policies and manipulative controls within the banking and financial system. Uh, interest rates, if they're set by the marketplace, bring together the wishes of savers to set aside part of their income with the desire of others to borrow money beyond their own income's ability for such things as investment and capital formation and productions for the future. But governments through their central banks have a tendency to want to manipulate these things, particularly try to artificially stimulate good times and investment and employments. So they artificially lower interest rates through monetary expansion, uh, setting off what ends up being a mismatch between actual savings of the economy and the amount of borrowed created funds being used to try to undertake investment projects, all of which brings about a maladjustment, a mismatching, a distorted pattern uh, in, uh, of both the types and the time durations of investment projects relative to the amount of real savings in the society that is able to sustain them in general until their maturity and, uh, and, and their, and their uh, sustainability. So eventually a, an artificial inflationary boom by monetary and interest rate manipulation set the stage for an inescapable downturn or bust uh, when all the mismatches and the distortions finally become uh, unable to hide anymore. Uh, and that in fact, the recession period is a recovery Re readjustment, rebalancing time, and not the horrible thing that people make it say. What, what was horrible is when political and infusions and influences by governments and central banks have brought about the process of distorting it to begin with. If one has taken uh, uh, too much uh, uh, of the wrong foods in, uh, and then your body has to sort of cleanse itself, and you have uh, a, a hard time of stomach aches and other withdrawal effects, that's a healing process. That's not, that's not the problem. The problem was what preceded it that got you into this dilemma. And that was the position that Hayek basically was saying um, against Keynes. Keynes believed that the government should have the monetary and the, and, the, and the fiscal tools to constantly manipulate and juggle and twist and turn the economy uh, based on what they think employment should be, output should be, prices should be. And Hayek was saying that this is a, a recipe for for, for greater instability and not the macro stability that Keynes thought would come from it. Uh, then out of this, why are these mismatches between savings and investment and in what people think should be produced and how they should produce it, and over what time horizons they should be produced and what the reality is? And he said, it's basically the, the monetary manipulations are distorting the prices in the market. And he came to the conclusion that prices are signals, right? A vast division of labor of, of millions. And now if you think of the globe, billions of people, they don't know each other. They're never gonna meet each other. They don't even know about each other's existence as concrete, specific human beings. But somehow we all get coordinated with all that we're doing to bring this vast system of global division of labor into more or less constantly adapting and adjusting and coordinating patterns so that Things are there that we want in the form, shapes, types, and often at the prices we're willing to pay and can afford to pay. How does this constantly occur? Well, prices have to be telling the truth. They have to be telling what consumers want and what producers on the supply side of the market think they could do, given the opportunity cost of using resources in different ways, uh, what the costs would be to doing so. So prices are a vast global communication system by which we talk. Now, if monetary manipulations can distort the price signals and bring about these, the, these, these instabilities of booms and busts, what happens if the government tries to destroy the price system by nationalizing everything, taking over the economy, uh, doing away with private property and the means of production, uh, uh, outlaws, the buying and selling and the higgling of the marketplace and the agreeing between, between consumers and producers, because now the state is the only game in town. Well, by doing away with the price system, I have argued, you do away with the communication mechanism through which people talk to each other 
so that supplies and demands can be brought into tendency balances so that, uh, to use a phrase of Frederick Bastiat's, Paris gets fed. Uh, and his argument in, in, uh, in the use of knowledge in society in particular, and his other articles critiquing socialism, is that institutionally central planning can't work because you do away with the essential mechanism by which information and knowledge can be shared and flowed and be coordinated, integrated among a vast number of people when more knowledge is involved than any one mind or even the best minds of hundreds of people could ever know, master, integrate, and know wisely to use, then the actors themselves disperse, decentralize, and spread across regions, nations, continents, the globe. So if you want chaos and distortion, as well as the tyranny that comes with government socialism, because then the government is the only game in town and the government basically controls your life. If you want poverty, if you want disaster, if you want economic hardship, then go for socialism. If you want freedom and prosperity, there is no alternative to the liberty of a free society working in the context of the institutions of competitive, open, free market e economy and markets that enable prices to form, prices to inform, prices to share, prices to coordinate, and bring about the world that we take increasingly for, uh, for granted, and that is a high, uh, our existing standard of living and a higher one. And then finally, I said, well, look here. If, if, if government central planning can do this, what happens when government resorts to in various forms of intervention and is guided by such notions as, well, we're going to redistribute wealth on the basis of social justice. And I mentioned that in the 1970s, he published a, his last sort of great book, Law, Legislation, and Liberty, it appeared in three volumes. The second vo volume one, which is what you were alluding to, is based upon wh what is the meaning of law and the rule of law uh, and the law of a free society. But volume two has the subtitle, The Mirage of Social Justice. How do you know what a person socially deserves in terms of justice? Justice is a negative concept that as long as an individual basically, I'm simplifying here, hasn't killed, hasn't robbed, hasn't defrauded, has abided by and fulfilled, voluntarily entered into contact, uh, contracts, justice has been followed. But the, the, the socialist conception and the interventionist conception is that justice is a fair distribution of wealth. But who determines what's fair? That's why Hayek calls it a mirage. Let's suppose it is a man who things come easily to, but has a family uh, of, of five kids and a sick mother. Another man, everything comes hard to him, but he only has a wife and one kid and they're healthy. Who deserves the bigger income? Who deserves the bigger income? The person to whom everything comes easily, but has a large family that has various medical problems, or a guy who has to work for every penny, but he has a healthy family. Who deserves a higher income? Who desires a better redistributive share? How do you decide any of this? And Hike's point is you can't. You would have to assume that the planner, the, the social engineer, the political masters of the society could know enough, have godlike knowledge of like, you know, he knows when you're asleep, he knows when you're awake, he knows when you've been naughty in bed, and, and, and he's gonna give you your fair Christmas share. I mean, that's impossible. So why does it end up being the power of special interest groups buying and plundering each other through the political process of who can gain access of regulatory control and redistributive power through taxation to determine their plundered shares, which has nothing to do with this mirage of a social justice. The only justice, the only social justice is the justice that occurs voluntarily and peacefully and quote spontaneously out of the interactions of the market. And what you earn is what people think you're worth in your contribution to making things they desire and are willing to pay for in the vast system of division of labor of the free society. Yeah, you, you brought up some good points, especially the point about the price system and the, and the business cycle. Uh, that, you know, when I, when I was first getting into this, I'd been an economics major and, you know, I was taught that the business cycle was part of the capitalist system, 
that, oh, there's the boom and then there's the bust. And it's all just an inherent part of capitalism. Well, it takes Hayek to explain to me that this has nothing to do with a free market system, a, a genuine capitalist system. This is all about government intervention. This is the, the Federal Reserve, the central bank that is distorting, as you point out, the investment decisions and the spending decisions of people because they're, they're here inflating the money supply. And so people make their calculations based on the, uh, th this notion that, oh my gosh, there's prosperity, and it, but it's a fake prosperity because you have all this paper money that's being printed essentially or expansion of credit. So people say, oh my gosh, I need to start expanding my business. I need to start hiring people because business is, is flooding in, consumers are flooding in, but it's all fake. And uh, there's no capital basis to sustain it. It's all based on this inflated money supply. And then the, the bust comes. And, and as you call it, it's the, the readjustment period after what the Fed has done. Well, this has nothing to do with a free market. This is obviously government intervention. And so I was really struck when, when Hayek didn't come up with a plan for, for reforming the Fed or reforming central banks. He carried to a much higher level, Richard, much higher than even the gold standard. I mean, America had lived under a gold monetary system, silver monetary system for more than 100 years, which was a fantastic system because federal officials couldn't print gold and silver. And so you, you had a relatively stable monetary system. But what was great about Hayek was he raised my vision and the vision of other people to a higher level and say, you know, let's get government out of monetary area entirely. Just the denationalization of money, he called it, the separation of money in the state. Let the free market decide the medium of exchange that people turn toward. Now you're talking about a solid monetary system, which people can then use in rational calculations. I mean, as you point out, and this is, I think, one of his greatest contributions was the price system is a very sophisticated, intricate system. It, it's the, like you say, the messaging system. It's how people calculate. Okay, should I buy that? Should I go on vacation? Should I invest in that? And you're, you're calculating it all with how much money the hotel is going to cost you on that vacation or how much that new car is going to cost. And, and so you want a rational system that's enabling you to make these calculations. And when government's tampering with this system, you cannot make rational calculations. And then the other thing, Richard, that I mentioned earlier was his concept of the spontaneous order. I mean, this was just ingenious. The, uh, you mentioned how Paris gets fed. I mean, this was Bastiat's concept of, you know, you walk into a grocery store and it's amazing. You walk in there early in the morning, all these fresh fruits and fresh vegetables and uh, things on the, on the shelves, unbelievable choices you have. How did all this happen? Well, it happens spontaneously. There's no government planner making sure that, oh, there's enough uh, oranges and tomatoes and asparagus over at Whole Foods or Harris Teeter or whatever the grocery store is, Giant or whatever. This all happens because you have multitudes, millions, countless people all over the world that are all seeking their own little special interests, trying to improve their well-being, that and know their particular time and place and circumstances. They're making rational calculations in their part of the world. They're using their knowledge and expertise in what they're doing. And all of this comes together somehow or another in what we might call the miracle of the market, the spontaneous order that brings into existence something that no central planner could have ever conceived. That to me was just in, uh, uh, an insight of in, in ingenuity. I mean, this guy was absolutely a genius to be able to recognize this because the central planner, all he has is his own mind, his own knowledge. And so he doesn't take advantage of all of the dispersed knowledge among these multitudes, millions of people that are all using their own individual knowledge and bringing into existence something that the central planner could not even conceive. Yeah, uh, let, let me just sort of amplify that a bit. And that is, see, Hayek's emphasis on the spontaneous order obviously applied to how markets work, uh, how institutions in the market develop and evolve, uh, such as money. But he also is focusing on the wider context as well, that all of society 
has ultimately emerged as a spontaneous order. No one planned language, no one planned mores and rules of etiquette or good manners or 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 or, or the, the the techniques by which people interact in society. These have all evolved over centuries. The institutional glue of how people interact and 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 uh, benefit each other and reconcile conflicts and differences among each other. Uh, language is a perfect example of this. You know, if, if you were to say, well, where did language begin? Well, we could imagine some be benevolent king of long time past who said, my poor subjects, they can't communicate with each other. I'm going to appoint a royal commission to design and create the first language. Well, the absurdity of that is that in what language would the royal commission have conversed among themselves to design the first language? <laughs> Now, th this, is, this, is, this, is, this is my sort of dumb way of explaining this. Imagine the ancient times of two cavemen, and one caveman is looking over at the other, and the other caveman is, is standing below a large boulder uh, above, uh, on which is a saber-toothed tiger. And the guy who's seeing this yells out, Uga! And Uga means, look up, dummy, you're, dummy, you're in trouble. But the guy below the rock hears Uga and goes like this. And the tiger pounces and eats him. But that's the beginning of language, a sound that gets repeated. Uga, dummy, look up. That's how language evolves. So a sound becomes identified with an object, a person, an action, an emotion. Then it's tied together with other sounds that become what we now call the sounds indicating the parts of a sentence in its grammar. And those change over time. And no one plans this. Again, I'll tell my students sometimes, in high school, we ever assigned a Shakespearean play, Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, Julius Caesar, any of these famous ones. Most of them still say yes. And I said, was it easy to read William Shakespeare? No. I said, you know, we're only separated by 400 odd years from Bill Shakespeare and us, but his English seems so different than ours. Why? Because every day in some little way, words are used differently, not by governments, not by command of a legislature, but just in these conversations, oh, a nuance, a meaning, a subtlety, a different way of putting the words together that slightly modifies the grammatical uses of things. And that becomes our language. The same way text messaging, you don't use the word you anymore, Y-O-U, you just do a you. Now that drives me crazy sometimes, but 25 years from now, that'll be the new spelling and grammar. But no one's planned this. It's evolved as people found it useful or desirable or creative. And that's all the institutions of society. It involves more people over more years and generations than any one group of planners could ever know or understand or, or appreciate or, or even see the reason for. That's why a society has to be left free. So all of these, these things that emerge out of the individual actions of people associating with others bring about improvements, modifications, changes, innovations, and new standards and rules as time go on that no one can even understand or even fully appreciate until maybe centuries later, you're looking backward, oh, that's how it came about and why? But you couldn't understand it at the time because you're in the middle of it. And the government has to stay out of the way and allow society to just blossom and take its own forms and evolutionary shapes through the free interactions of billions of people, because that is real progress and not the state controlling you and commanding you and telling you, this is the way you speak, this is the way you act, this is the way you can do this, that's the way you can do that. That is putting society in a straight chocolate. Society has to be left free that no human being is a straight jacket, whether it be in the marketplace or in social arenas or in their personal life, as long as they abide by those ancient rules, you don't kill, you don't steal, you don't defraud. As long as those rules are followed, as Leonard Reed once entitled one of his books, the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education, anything that's peaceful. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to wrap things up. You, you did remind me though on the language point that somebody invented a language called Esperanto many years ago and it went nowhere 
Yes. <laughs> Unlike the spontaneous order. Okay, let's wrap it up with just, um, Richard, are, are, where would people go? In there, the collected works of Friedrich Hayek, if they, what, what, what do you recommend people do if they want to delve into Hayek? Well, uh, 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 an excellent scholar named Bruce Caldwell, who teaches at U Duke University, uh, is the general editor of collected, Hayek's collected writings, which have been issued over 18 volumes uh, by University of Chicago Press. Uh, but there are smaller uh, collections that are worth looking at. He has an excellent book, which he published in 1948 of many of his best essays, including the use of knowledge in society called Individualism and Economic Order. Uh, then there's just the standalone volumes such as The Road to Serfdom, his classic book written during the Second World War on how socialism inescapably leads to plan, uh, both planning and tyranny by the very nature of imposing a plan on all of society. Uh, and he explains such things as why the worst get on top, how planning leads to the worst getting in charge to manage our lives. And then, of course, the book you refer to, The Constitution of Liberty, which came out in 1960. It has three parts. The first part is on the issue of the spontaneous order, which we've been talking about. Part two is the one you alluded to at the beginning, which is on the rule of law. And then part three, which uh, uh, it could be considered the weakest part of the book, uh, he talks about the welfare state in ways that uh, he evolved out of later to some extent. And by the way, if I can just make this one other point, you, you were saying the importance of Hayek's argument about denationalizing de money, the separation of money in the state, to show how people evolve and develop their thinking in right directions. When Hayek came to the United States right after the Second World War, basically on a, on a book tour with the road to serfdom, he appeared on several American radio shows, right, radio talk shows. And on one of them, he was asked about, well, what should government do? And he, he, he said in one of these, it's, it's reprinted in one of his volumes, uh, that uh, well, one of the things government should, should centrally plan the monetary system. How could you have a monetary system in which the government wasn't in charge? Uh, now, it has to be by the right rules and right you know, uh, methods, but, but you see, he, his, his thinking continued to evolve in a freedom direction. So in the post-war period, he came to you know, I was wrong. It's not only not needed, but the very inherentness of government control of money is inescapably leading to bad consequences. So that in 1976, a couple of years after winning the Nobel Prize, he published this little book published by the Institute of Economic Affairs in London called Denationalization of Money. Yeah, that's great, yeah. Just quite a heroic guy, and and again, you know, a libertarian that achieved tremendous success uh, winning the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, so, Richard, on that note, I greatly uh, enjoyed the conversation as always. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks for your support of FFF. Come to visit us at FFF.org for 34 years of this type of stuff. Austrian economics. Richard's fantastic book, Monetary Central Planning in the State, which I highly recommend that FFF has published. And Richard, I look forward to talking to you next week. Yeah, and if I can just make one more plug here, for those who might be interested in knowing more about Hayek and Mises, my other book, kindly published by FFF, Austrian Economics and Public Policy, there are several chapters on Hayek and his ideas in that book. All right, awesome. Uh, look forward to seeing you next week, Richard. Mm -hmm.